So far, we've mainly been focusing on the forces that affect an atmosphere in the short term. But now we need to look at long-term effects. How does an atmosphere form? How does it change over time? And how does it disappear? These will help us understand why some planets have an atmosphere and some don't, as well as why these atmospheres are so different from each other. We'll start by looking at origins of atmospheres, the processes that cause a planet to create an atmosphere. Then we'll look at the main ways a planet can lose an atmosphere. After we've seen all the major processes of gaining and losing gas, we'll look at some examples of how these have played out on different worlds. Next, we'll consider just the terrestrial planets and a couple of feedback cycles that operate in their atmospheres. We'll also compare how feedback has driven the evolution of the atmospheres of Mars and Venus and see what it can tell us about what's currently going on on the Earth. Where do the gases in an atmosphere come from? There are at least four different ways gas can be added to a planet's atmosphere. The first way to add gas is through outgassing. This is what an atmospheric scientist calls volcanism. As we already know, volcanism depends on the planet's internal heat, so outgassing will be most important in worlds that have a lot of internal heat. In other words, large, geologically active worlds with solid surfaces. There are many gases that can be produced by outgassing, including nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and sulfur dioxide. The next way to add gas is through evaporation or sublimation. Evaporation means converting liquids to gases, while sublimation is converting solids directly into gases. For this to happen, the world's surface has to heat up, so changing surface temperature is important here. Materials that can evaporate are called volatiles. There are several common volatiles in the solar system, including water, carbon dioxide, methane, and ammonia. Next up is particle bombardment. The solar wind is a stream of particles that moves out from the sun in all directions at high speed. On planets with no other atmosphere, this wind can hit the surface and remain close by, forming a very thin layer of gas. Also, the particles hit hard enough that they can release gas from surface rocks or ices. Some of the gases that form this way include helium and sodium. The last way to make an atmosphere is through gas accretion. Remember from the chapter on solar system formation that the largest planets were able to accrete hydrogen and helium gas from the disk around the sun. While some of this gas is compressed to form the liquid interiors of giant planets, their outer layers remain in the gas phase and form atmospheres. Besides the four sources of gas we just looked at, there is one more process that can add gas to an atmosphere, and that's life. An example of the importance of life on a planetary scale here on Earth comes from considering oxygen, the second most abundant gas in our atmosphere. Free oxygen is a highly reactive chemical. Given half a chance, it will combine with other elements in the environment. Some of the processes we see here on Earth that use up oxygen include both rusting and fire. In fact, the Earth is the only place in the solar system where you could light a match. Everywhere else, there isn't enough free oxygen to feed the flame. But if oxygen gets tied up in compounds this easily, then there has to be some way of replenishing it in our atmosphere. Otherwise, in a short time, there just wouldn't be any. Fortunately, here on Earth, oxygen is being replaced all the time through the process of photosynthesis. Green plants and blue-green algae are constantly taking in carbon dioxide, one of the most common gases in other terrestrial planets, and releasing oxygen. The carbon goes into making the plants themselves. In fact, the geologic evidence tells us that the early Earth had little or no free oxygen. For the first couple of billion years of the Earth's history, the rocks that solidified on the surface formed in an oxygen-free atmosphere. It wasn't until 2 to 2.5 billion years ago that blue-green algae had produced enough oxygen for it to build up in the atmosphere. Many people think that life needs oxygen, 
and certainly for animals like us, this is true. But in a more general sense, oxygen needs life. There are five ways that a planet can lose an atmosphere. In most cases, these are a reversal of the ways it adds gas. The first of these is condensation. Condensation is the opposite of evaporation or sublimation. Here, a gas condenses to form a solid or a liquid. As with evaporation, a key part of condensation is that the temperature has to change so the gases get too cold to remain in the gas phase. In many cases, the same gases evaporate and condense back and forth as the temperature changes. Water vapor on the Earth is a good example of this. It evaporates from the oceans and then condenses to form clouds and frost. The next way to lose an atmosphere is through atmospheric cratering. Very large impactors, the sort that completely melt a planet when they hit, can also blast a large part of the planet's atmosphere out into space. Obviously, these kinds of impacts don't happen in the solar system today. But during the formation of the solar system, this may have been an important way that some planets could lose all or part of their earliest atmospheres. Solar wind bombardment is also a way to lose an atmosphere. We've already seen that airless worlds can get a very thin atmosphere from the solar wind. However, for a planet that has an atmosphere already, this bombardment will tend to strip off much of the gas. This happens because the solar wind moves much faster than any planet's escape speed. So as the solar wind hits the planetary atmosphere, it blows the outer layers of gas away, sort of like dropping the planet into a sandblaster. There's one way a planet can protect itself from the solar wind, having a magnetic field. When the charged particles in the solar wind hit a magnetic field, they get deflected around the planet rather than hitting the upper atmosphere. So having a magnetic field helps a planet keep its atmosphere. Another way to lose an atmosphere is through chemical reactions. Atmospheric gases can react with surface rocks, pulling these gases out of the air. Also, high-energy sunlight can fuel chemical reactions in an atmosphere, causing simple molecules to combine into more complex ones. For example, in Titan's atmosphere, methane reacts with sunlight to produce the complex hydrocarbons that make up its orange haze. These haze droplets get big enough that they eventually fall to Titan's surface. Unless there's some way to replace it, the methane we see in Titan's atmosphere will eventually be used up by this. The last way to lose an atmosphere is through thermal escape. We'll look at this more on the next slide. Thermal escape is the most important way that a world can lose an atmosphere. The idea behind thermal escape is simple. If the atoms or molecules of gas in the exosphere are moving faster than the world's escape speed, then they'll escape out to space. Of course, this is going to depend on how strong the planet's gravity is. If the planet is large and the gravity is strong, then the escape speed is high and the gas will have to have a high speed to leave the planet. A smaller world will have a weaker gravity and a slow escape speed, so gas can escape more easily. The speed of the gas atoms is determined by two things, the gas temperature and the mass of the individual atoms. We saw near the start of the course that the temperature of a gas is really a measure of the kinetic energy of the atoms. So as the temperature goes up, the speed of the atoms goes up. However, the mass of the atoms is also important. For a given temperature, more massive atoms and molecules move more slowly than the less massive ones. So at a given temperature, a light gas, like hydrogen or helium, has atoms moving much faster than a heavy gas like nitrogen or carbon dioxide. In a gas with a mix of atoms, as shown here, the light atoms are bouncing around at high speed, while the heavy ones are lumbering along much more slowly. So if any of the atoms in the gas in the exosphere are moving fast enough, then they can escape to outer space. Now we'll put together all of these different ways of gaining or losing an atmosphere and pick out some of the key trends that will determine whether or not a world is likely to have an atmosphere. 
First, large planets are more likely to have an atmosphere than small ones. The two most common ways of forming an atmosphere are gas accretion and outgassing, and both of these are much more likely on large planets. Gas accretion requires a high-mass planet to even get started, while outgassing requires volcanic activity, and this is more likely on worlds that are large enough to have a warm interior. On the other hand, small worlds can lose an atmosphere more easily. Gravity is weak on a small world, so gas can escape more easily. This also means that atmospheric cratering can more easily blast gas off of a world. Finally, small worlds are more likely to lack a magnetic field, so they won't be protected from solar wind bombardment. Next, a cooler planet will be more likely to hold on to gas than a hot one, since lower temperatures will mean that the atoms are more likely to move slowly enough to be held by the planet's gravity. However, if the gas gets too cold, it will freeze onto the surface. Finally, at any given temperature, light gases are more likely to escape out in space because they're moving faster. However, heavier gases are more likely to freeze onto the surface. There's nowhere in the solar system where it's cold enough for hydrogen or helium to freeze, but water, ammonia, and methane are all frozen in parts of the solar system. Here's another table that lists all of the ways a planet can gain or lose an atmosphere. Once again, go through the material we've just covered to fill it in. For the gain or loss column, saying whether or not the process causes a planet to gain gases, lose gases, or both. For relation to mass, say whether adding mass to a planet makes this more or less likely to happen. Under relation to temperature, say if increasing the temperature makes this more or less likely, or if it has no effect. Finally, under what kind of gas, say what sort of gas is produced, or if a particular type of gas is more likely to be lost in this process. Now let's look at a couple of specific worlds in our solar system to see how these processes have interacted. We'll start with Jupiter the largest planet in the solar system. As we talked about in the solar system formation chapter, Jovian planets get their atmospheres from gas accretion. This means that the bulk of their gas is in the form of hydrogen and helium. In fact, in all four Jovians, there's so much hydrogen and helium that they not only make up the atmosphere, but also a substantial part of their liquid interiors. Jupiter is a high-mass planet far from the Sun, so it's a perfect candidate for holding on to these very light gases. The gravity is strong, and the escape speed is 60 kilometers per second, more than five times as large as the Earth's. Also, exosphere temperatures are low in the outer solar system, so there's very little thermal escape. While Jupiter's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, there are some heavier gases like water and ammonia in the atmosphere as well, more than can be accounted for from gas accretion. These probably came from the evaporation of icy comets that have hit the planet over billions of years. We've even seen such impacts, leaving scars like this in the clouds until they were dispersed by winds. Saturn's moon Titan is a fascinating case with a more complex history than Jupiter. Titan is the only moon with a substantial atmosphere, and it's an atmosphere with some similarities to the Earth. The main gas in Titan's atmosphere is nitrogen, just like the Earth. Some of the other important gases are argon and methane, but here I'd like to focus on the nitrogen. Titan is an icy outer solar system moon, so it's plausible that its atmosphere is derived from the ices in the crust and mantle. However, nitrogen ice is rare in this part of the solar system. Even at 10 AU from the sun, it's too warm for nitrogen to freeze. However, ammonia is an important ice in the Saturn system, and ammonia is a compound of nitrogen and hydrogen. Both outgassing and evaporation of ammonia are possible on Titan. So it's likely that early in its history, Titan had an ammonia-rich atmosphere. 
High-energy photons from the sun will split ammonia into nitrogen and hydrogen gases. Remember that hydrogen is a very light gas, so it can escape from a moon-like Titan quite easily. Nitrogen is much heavier, so it remains in the atmosphere, neither escaping to space nor returning to the surface. Titan is unique in the solar system, and it's reasonable to ask why that would be. After all, there are other large moons in the outer solar system, so why was Titan the only one to develop a thick atmosphere? There are probably several things that have contributed to this. First, Titan is the only large moon of Saturn, being almost the same diameter as the planet Mercury. The next largest Saturnian moon, Rhea, is less than one-third the diameter and one-fiftieth the mass of Titan. So there's much less chance that Rhea can either create or keep gas. Also, the other large moons in the solar system are either close enough to the sun that they don't have any ammonia ice, like Jupiter's Ganymede here, or they're so far away that even nitrogen freezes onto the surface. So in our solar system, Titan is in a unique position. But it's imaginable that in other solar systems, there may be multiple large moons at the right distance from their star to produce thick atmospheres like this. Okay. Based on what we've learned, look through this list of planets and decide which ones are likely to have an atmosphere. Explain your choices, both for the ones you select and the ones you didn't. And for the ones that do have an atmosphere, explain how these atmospheres are likely to form. <laughs>